And greetings to the brethren in the sanctuary in the mighty name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Uh, greetings to our dear brother. I know your face very well, but I'm unsure where I've seen you. I'm sure it's been here somewhere before. Mikhail's father, yes, greetings. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. Greetings, greetings. And um, our dear sister behind, Sister Joanne, you're our dear sister too. Um, if you could just introduce yourself, for, maybe for my um, edification, I'm sure the brethren probably know already. Praise the Lord, my dear sister. Praise the Lord. Amen. Greetings, Sandra. Sister Sandra, I'm, I'm sure. Yes. Amen. Amen, amen. Welcome, Sandra, in Jesus' name. As always, I'm sure Sister Genevieve has told you the process, but feel free to participate with any thoughts and uh, answers that you may have. Uh, today, Lesson 12, we're talking about disciple under construction. Amen. Disciple under construction. Um, it's a wonderful analogy to really think about, because if you look at anything that's under construction, it goes through a particular process, right? You know, uh, Elder Sherwood will tell you, obviously, better than me, but anything that goes under construction, a lot of time it gets pretty ugly before it gets better, <laughs> right? How many of us, I'm sure we've seen a, work, a site under construction, greetings. Uh, we'll see the building under construction that it gets a lot uglier, it gets very dusty, it gets very messy, chaotic. Um, it goes through all those things before it makes a beautiful grand building that people want to visit and enter into. So if you think about that analogy, and many things we can draw from that, even the foundation, the structure, building fitly, framed together, all these things is biblical, if you actually go into the depths of it. Um, it's talking about you and I, our tabernacles as individuals and as a collective body is under construction. Amen? So today we're going to be looking at the life mainly of Apostle Peter, a good lesson uh, to go into. And we'll read the memory verse together after three as it's quite lengthy. Um, we'll start after three. One, two, three. Simon Peter, sorry, I only heard my voice. My right is blocked, so I'm not sure if it was just me. We'll start together after three, okay? Okay, should we read it on the screen? Let's read it on the screen. Um, verse 16 and 17, just so we're um, with the KGV, what we're most familiar with. One, two, three. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee but my Father which is in heaven. Amen and amen. You know, yet again, we, we, we're looking at the life of Peter, but there's something that I want to say from the straight off the offset. And we have to remember this, matter of fact. Every single one of us didn't choose God. We didn't choose God. God chose us. Think about that. God chose us as much as, and as frustrating as it can be, that understanding can help you sometimes, even with people that you minister to or share the gospel with. You do your bit, but it's God that ultimately does the calling. God does the calling and he does the process. He grants repentance, as another passage said. It's God that leads you to repentance. So all we have to do is do our bit. Peter answered in kind and Jesus revealed that, yeah, you know, I already knew that. Why? Because the Father has chosen you. It's not that you've made a, you, you didn't make a head decision. So we have to remember that um, in all that we do. If we're on this process of construction, it's important to remember that. Why? Because the Father has called you. Amen? So don't be nervous. If you can finish it or whatever, whether you're in a safe place, if you're on the process of construction under the Father, then God's chosen you, not you. You didn't choose God. The key text is taken from John 12, verses 1 to 19. We'll read that in uh, one of the questions following. Um, objective is to look for traces of the Beatitudes in Peter's discipleship journey. Amen. So we're going to examine his life and see, does his life mirror all that we've been going into depths, which started with brokenness, mourning, all of those things? Does Peter's life reflect the Beatitudes? Um, 
Brother Saeed, I always ask you for the introduction, but if there's a volunteer, I want to open it for a volunteer first. John 15, 16. Uh, what, if you just read that for us, please. Uh, John fifteen sixteen, uh, Elder Show is asking to be put on the screen. Yes, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Amen. Amen. So there it is yet again, obviously, to reinforce the point that we have not, Chosen God, he's chosen us. A royal priesthood, chosen. Amen. All these words is talking about that God has done it. Amen. So it's important to remember that. And another interesting thing, I see the hand. Um, another interesting thing is when you think about it, what, what's the purpose that he called us? It says it in this passage here. What's the purpose that he's called us? That we should bring forth fruit. Amen. Don't forget your point, please, my brother. Um, but that's a really interesting thing. And literally yesterday, I've said it, shared it recently, but yesterday, it's like the first time I'm trying to actively, I have a grapevine, and I'm trying to actively get good, decent-sized fruits to grow this season. And there's loads of little clusters that are forming, but what you have to do, and I've learned this, by the way, hence why I'm sharing it, one of the things that you have to do is you have to cut off the ends and the branches that don't bear forth fruit so that the energy of the plant is conserved to going to the branches that have fruit on it. Otherwise, if you just let the branches that don't have fruit stay on the vine, it's going to be taking away energy and growth from the fruit. That's deep. Because if you think about us, that the, Christ said any, any, any branch that brings forth for fruit, they're in this pruned. So think about that. The purpose why we're called is to bring forth fruit. That's the objective God wants from us. If we don't bring in forth fruit, then we're literally just wasting energy from others that will bring forth fruit. That's, what, that's, that's the analogy that's being brought out there. Um, so just remind me of your name. I can't call you Mikel's father. Brother Mikel's father. Brother Paul. Brother Paul. Greetings, my friend. Uh, did you have a point? Do you want it to share? No, I just like the way you know, really how you Okay. So if you, if you just grab a microphone so the brethren online can hear you, it's a, we, we're going to have that one floating around. Yeah, thank you, Brother Dan. I was just following through with the lesson that mm. um, we're under divine construction. Even though we were created, but sin has marred its image, and therefore the potter needs to reconstruct us. Yes. And as you as you bring it out in um, Matthew... Is it Matthew 16, 6, that God has, no, that's Peter. But God has chosen us, right? Mm. He says, while we were yet sinner, yeah. Christ yeah. died for us. Yes. So we see that he redeems us for his own divine purpose. Amen. And that divine purpose is to reconstruct us yeah. and to help us to bear fruit. Amen. Uh, that fruit is to bear in our life and also to be witness Amen. for him. Amen and amen. Yes, thank you, Brother Paul. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's going to come a lot clearer when we go through um, how deep it is when we study the life of Peter. Um, all those points will be amplified a lot more as well. Um, so if, Brother Saeed, please, if I can ask you to read the introduction for us. Uh, I didn't see any volunteers. So, so yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Lesson 12, Disciple, Disciple Under Construction. Introduction. Throughout this series, we've established that the Beatitudes are a kind of training manual for making disciples. It seems fitting then to devote this final lesson to looking at a biblical character in whose life we may find traces of the Beatitudes, <clears throat> resulting in deep transformation. Perhaps the best candidate for this assignment is Peter, Jesus' problem disciple. Not only did Jesus call Peter despite his obvious flaws, but Jesus also cast a new vision for the disciple Peter. Also Jesus, oh sorry, but Jesus also cast a new vision for the disciple Peter would become. Okay. The gospel contain, gospels contain intriguing Peter, uh, pictures of Peter that show his rough and tumble side, as well as his growth into Christ-like maturity. 
Peter flat out refused to allow Jesus to wash his feet during the Last Supper, rebuked Jesus for predicting his death, and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. The list goes on. Yet all, the, all along the way, we also see traces of love and devotion to Jesus in Peter's life. When Jesus quizzed his disciples about his identity, Peter gave the correct answer. Despite repeatedly denying he knew Jesus, Peter followed from a distance during his trials. On the day of Pentecost, Peter articulated the claims of Jesus and his resurrection, and according to tradition, when he himself faced crucifixion, Peter asked to be hung upside down, thinking himself unworthy to die in the same position as his master. How was Peter transformed from a hot-tempered fisherman to Jesus' model disciple? Are there traces of the Beatitudes along the path of Peter's journey to wholeness? Peter was there when Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount, likely sitting in the front row. He heard Jesus speak the Beatitudes. It is safe to presume that he took them to heart. So let's take a look. Did Peter come to recognize his poverty of soul? Are there tears in Peter's story? Did he ever get to the place where he no longer had a desire to call the shots in his own life? What about hungering and thirsting for righteousness? What about mercy? Being pure in heart, peacemaking and persecution. We will explore these in the discussion, seg the discussion segment of this lesson. Perhaps we've never connected the dots between Peter's journey and the Beatitudes, but a close look at his life will reveal traces of them. Some aren't as clear as others. Still, we are not surprised. Are there traces of Beatitudes in our lives? For devoted followers of Christ, there has to be. As with Peter, some of them may not be as traceable. But the good news is that when we, uh, the good news is that we have time to make up the difference. Remember the words of Alan Redpath in the making of a man of God, lessons from the life of David. The conversion of a soul is the miracle of a moment, but the manufacture of a saint is the task of a lifetime. So keep climbing Mount Beatitudes and keep encouraging others along the trail to keep going. The view from the summit is beautiful and evokes joy, and it readies us for the challenges of the valley below, where teeming masses search desperately for meaning and hope. The goal of our discipleship is becoming and reproducing happy and whole students of Jesus. Let's keep at it. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Saeed. Yes, wonderful. And yet again, when you look at the life of Peter, it's really, it speaks volumes to me personally. Um, and, th and there's another aspect that's not mentioned in this, but I think it's actually a big part of understanding who Peter is. Um, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 9, which gives us a bit more information about Peter, and he's just, he's life. Um, in verse 5, um, Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, which I think is important to add to understand Peter, he says, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as the other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Now, Cephas is obviously Peter, another, his name meaning a little rock, but a little stone, there you go. So Cephas, he's talking about Peter there. But yet again, it's revealing that Apostle Paul is trying to say that there was, a, there was an issue that other people was trying to say, well, he's an unmarried apostle and this and that, they're questioning it. But he's saying, but we have power to. Him as a, as a celebrate apostle, that's the gift he had, revealed that the brethren of the Lord, who's that talking about? Not talking about brethren of the Lord like me and you, it's talking about his brothers, like James, when you read in the book of James and Jude. It's talking about the blood brothers of Jesus had wives. Peter had a wife. And it shows that he was a man with a domestic setup. Now, yet again, it may not seem like much, but for a lot of people, when you think of him as an apostle, you don't think of the fact that he had family dynamics that he had to live up to and fulfill too. And that would have been a big part of who he is as an individual. He's not just somebody that can just go anywhere he wills and it's not going to affect his family. He was somebody that was directed to family. That would affect his discipleship. That's a big thing. So we know he was a fisherman. We now know that he was married. Other passages even show that when his mother-in-law was sick, Jesus went and healed her. So he was, yet again, somebody that had to deal with the pressures of everyday family life, like us too, which is something to remember. Um, so there's a lot that we're going to talk about. Here we're going to have a read, first and foremost, of Matthew 14, verses 25 
to 33, and also Matthew 16, verse 21 to 23. Um, the question is, what do these passages reveal about the kind of person Peter was in relation to the other disciples? So let's have a read. Matthew 14, verses 25 to 33. If I can have a volunteer with a microphone. Thank you, Sister Liz. Okay, so Matthew chapter 14 from 25 to 33, it says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is high, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind bustrous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Yes, thank you, Sister Liz. Yes, so first, what does that show about Peter verse, well, not verse, but, for, you know, I mean, when I say verse, comparing him in relation to the other disciples? Is there anything that is revealed in this? Think about it. What, what, what happened, first and foremost, just so we understand what we, what, we, what we just read there? And focus on the positives, by the way, in this, before we go into the obvious negative uh, yes. So basically, Peter started doubting. The minute he started doubting... Oh, is that the positive or the negative there? That's the negative. That's the negative, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay, but hold on, hold on. Well, you can say that again on the microphone, if you've got one there. Did you want to see... You had something to say? Okay, yes. Uh, Sister Laverne, please. Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. He trusted the Lord because if he did not trust him, he would not have asked him, can I come out on the water um, with you? Amen. Amen. First and foremost, and that's the positive that oftentimes we would miss. That, he, and it's just like a lot of us, by the way, if you really think about it, there's a lot of times we can ask God to do something for us, whatever that may be, and then along the process of going, believing that the Lord has called us to do it, we start doubting and we get fearful. DC. So a lot of times, this is this, he's living our experience in essence. It's just like when we think about Apostle um, Thomas. We know him as the doubting Thomas, but he was somebody that was skeptical. And he, even before, he says, "I'm ready to go to Jerusalem and die with Jesus." Before, so he was somebody that wanted proof, and he was ready to die for what he believed in. Um, and just like here, Peter versus the other disciples. The other disciples didn't attempt to. Do you see? The other side didn't even ask to or attempt to, um, Sister Joan. Yeah, um, funny enough, um, and um, help me with this one, but mm -hmm. I don't see this as trust at all. Okay. Mm -mm. I don't see this as trust at all because initially Jesus said, it is I. Mm. And um, that's basically enough for us to believe. Yes, this is Jesus, but... I don't see Peter um, trusting at all. I see it as pure doubt. Yeah. But then... That's a good... I like this, by the way. Yeah. Because no, not, not like I like a debate, but I like it because this opens up a whole, um, a whole good debate to have with this point here. Let, all right, Brother Saeed, I saw your hand fly up there. What do you think then, Brother Darren? Um, I would respectfully disagree. <laughs> reason why, the reason why I see it as... Um, you know, this is my favorite miracle, and this is my, one of my favorite stories of the Bible because I find it so relative in the sense that I relate to it so much because it's like you ask God, okay, if, if it's you, let me go. Like, as in, like, make the way for me. 
and then you do it, but then you take your eye off, mm. and then you get you get overwhelmed by all the waters and everything, and you your vision is starting to shake, mm. and then you start to sink, and then it's like, why did you doubt after that? Because he was walking on the water, yeah. So then that was the faith. He took a leap of faith. He took the step of faith, mm. and then it worked. But it's all the other things that get in our way that makes us start to doubt things. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is what it's saying. It's showing us under construction, even even our faith under construction. We'll come back to you in a moment, Sister Joanne. and br- brother, brother, brother Darren. Happy Sabbath. I, I was agreeing with uh, Brother Saeed and respectfully disagreeing with um, the sister. This is simple, in my opinion. Um, Peter was a fisherman. Mm. I, I would argue he knows water more than anyone else. Yes, yes. and we know that. And, and by the way, that's a big aspect a lot of people miss. By the way, you know when the sea was tossing and they was afraid. If these fishermen are afraid, what would we yeah. be? We'll probably pass out. <laughs> we wouldn't even have the chance to be afraid at that point. Sorry. Go, go, no, sorry okay. So I mean, he obviously knows you can't walk on water. So he saw Jesus walking on water. Oh, it's Jesus. Um, if it is you, yes, let me do it. He did it, and then the wind. So mm-hmm. you know, the wind is the the problem. But he did trust Jesus. In my opinion. yes, yes. Um, and do you know what? I didn't even I didn't even think of it in the aspect when I spoke about. Um, What's his name? Uh, sorry, what's, Apostle Thomas, <laughs> with all respect. And we've, I'm talking about Apostle Thomas. Yet again, this is, a, this is another prime example. If we, if, we, if we look at it, but let's just think about Apostle Thomas for a moment. Remember what he said? He said, look, I would not believe unless I put my fingers in the holes of his hands and his feet and touch him. Um, so we can liken that likewise with Gideon, for example. I was just going to go there. Gideon, G- thank you, Elder uh, Gideon, for example, and a lot of times we can look at him as a, well, it, let's put it in modern terms. So I hear a lot of times in church, people say, the Spirit told me to do this. The Spirit told me to do that. Matter of fact, the Spirit told me just now, Sister Dita, stand up, clap your hands and shout hallelujah three times. The Spirit told me to do that. Do it. And then that's it. For a lot of us, that's enough confirmation. Yeah, the Spirit told me to stand up and hallelujah three times. But there's no confirmation of the Spirit. Do you see? When the Word of God says in, um, what's it, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. And then we'll go back to the, this example of Peter. So we see it in this context. Um, John said, Beloved, believe not every spirit. And this is a good example of that passage. Because he sees a spirit on the water, which is an, that can open up a whole other can of worms, by the way. Because if we're talking about, if, 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 if biblically he understood that it could be possible for a spirit to visibly appear on water, do you see what I'm saying? And that's deep. Uh, yeah, again, going back to my example, for a lot of us, that's enough proof. There's, a, there's an angel there that's coming to speak to me. That's it. And then we'll believe it. But the Bible says that Satan can appear as an angel of light. Do you see? So literally, if you saw Satan himself, you may be inclined to worship and bow down thinking God has appeared to you. That's how beautiful he can appear. But when it's saying, beloved, try and believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God. And I'll stop there. Other passages even say, I see the hands. Other passages say, other passages says what? And prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Yeah? All things. Even the very Bible that we read, we have to prove. And once you have proof that the Bible is the word of God, now what do you do with that is the real question. Do you see? Hold on to it wholeheartedly. Uh, Sister Jack. Yes. And then I just want to clarify, Liz, and I know that I've been disagreed with, but can we just go back to that initial verse and then I'll, I'll, we can in, move in, on. In yeah. Matthew? Yeah, mm-hmm. we're, uh, Matthew 14, verse 25. Yeah, and in the fourth watch of the night, mm. Jesus said, went unto them, walking on the sea. Next verse. Mm. And when the disciples saw him, next verse, please, sorry. Oh, so, so, but, I but, want but, to, let's, let's what I back. basically but, want to but, say, because yeah, so, so I wanted to go to that verse. Initially, Peter definitely doubted him. But then, I, before so you kind you of went on to Saeed... Just to clarify, by the way, when you say doubted him, what do you mean? I, I, I literally wanted to go to the verse where um, it said that they if, were frightened. We... But I believe that Peter initially doubted him. 
And that's what happened with a lot of us. There's a lot of, there's doubt. And then something must have kicked into him. And I thought about it and I thought, well, my gosh, who goes out and walks into the sea just like that? So there must have been an element of faith. Yeah. But yeah. initially, I, I believe that Peter did doubt. Yeah. But, but, by uh, what he said. I see the hand, my dear. Hold on, right, listen. So yes. No, no, no. It's a, no. But it's a good point. Do you know the irony is? The irony is, uh, I'm not, it's, it's not so much, I, I see the perspective that you're coming from, that he did doubt that it was Jesus. But um, let me put it to you, let, let's, let's just try to give her a thing. Let, let's, let's put it another way then. Um, let's say, for example, you had a dream. You had a dream last night. And you are not sure, you, you think, you know that there's something significant about that dream. But you don't know what, from, if that dream is from God or not. What do you do with that? God appeared to you in a dream, but you're not sure if it was God or not. What do you do? So, so you do what? Exactly. If that was you, God, show me it was you. Do you see? Yes, this it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> bit, bit, Sorry. Um, Bear in mind, we haven't gone through. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't worry. We're, we're gonna go through. Ye of little faith. Uh, exactly. Do you think that aspect was about him dropping in the water don't, alone? No, don't don't no, don't worry. Don't worry. We, we, we're gonna go. We're gonna go line by line because it's very clear. But it's good that we get this because yet again we can talk about con disciples under construction and we don't know how to apply the voice of God in our lives. Yeah. Literally, as I said, literally, so many things happen in church. In church. That we all believe it's God that done that, or God is the author of that. And a few Bible scriptures can actually say quite contrary. Do you see what I'm saying? What, if that was God, well, what was that? Where's, it, where's that God? That doesn't match what I'm seeing here. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Well, we can run with it, and we can start building upon something that isn't actually what God wants us to build upon. It's actually building the wrong things. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll dissect this exact passage in a moment. Um, I think we basically. Well, I, like, I, like I think we're basically repeating. But what I can see here, not not um, saying that what been said earlier is not um, correct, or mm. what Sister Joan said is not, it's not is incorrect. Mm. But the, the overall, what I see here is his question is asking us what do these patches reveal uh, about the kind of person Peter was in re relating to the but others. Also, now Peter is curious. Pe mm. pe Peter wants to prove things. While the others were happy with the Just statement to say, it is I, Peter went further by saying, Lord, if I know, like Brother Darren said, you can't walk on water. It must be only the Lord can actually walk on water and allow mm. this thing. Yeah. So Lord is curious and he wants to prove if it is the Lord. Yes. He said, Lord, if, if it's a, you bid me, he said, bid me to come. Yeah. And Lord said, come. Then that's where the trust comes in, where we trust him to go on the water. Mm. Then once he started walking, the trust was there. Then afterward, Doubt. he started doubting because he actually realized that man is actually walking on water. Yes. So then as a fisherman, he proved now, ah, I can walk on water. And this only happened because the Lord himself allowing me to walk on the water. Yeah. And then he starts thinking because straight away he starts doubting that it's not possible for me to be walking on water. Mm. How is this happening? But then uh, that's, where, that's where I see where he's different from the others, where he wants proof. And when he got the proof, he's, 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 he's a curious person. He, he yes. wants answer to yeah. what he's been. He didn't take what he said he wants to prove amen. and to know that it's actually happened. And I can see it, taste it and feel it. Yes. Amen. 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 Absolutely. And yet again, we, 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 we'll make it very seamless, but you, you hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. Um, and we'll see it in verses the other disciples. And there's lessons for us yet again to learn from it. Um, Elder Sherwood. Thank you. Uh, I'll give way to Elder L.A. Slay, ma'am. He had his hand up before me. LA, okay, so no, thank you. Elder Sherwood. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, just don't want to repeat what sister just said just now, but just looking at the text where we see Peter take a leap, a leap, leap of faith. Mm. 
and we know the power that caused him to walk on the water is God. Mm. And while the sea was calm, he was walking. Mm. But when the wind began to be boisterous, that's when he began to, to lose faith. Yeah. No, we cannot walk on water by ourselves. And when things is going nice, we tend to be okay. Mm. But as soon as the storm begins, then fear comes. And Christ is saying, whether the sea is calm, whether it's boisterous, I'm here. Yeah. So True. as he takes his eyes off Christ, he begins to sink. Amen. Now he cries out. So when we go into our trials and our trouble, we must remember to cry out to Christ, amen. who we who is leading us. Amen. And amen. Wonderfully said. Amen and amen. Yes, thank you. Um, absolutely. And, and yet again, it's exactly what we go through. We know God's our provider. We know that. We said, God, if you, if, if you can provide for me, then provide for me. And God provides for you. And then in the moment when you get hit with a bailiff letter, or I don't know, a, a court letter, and then all of a sudden, the, the winds get boisterous, and all of a sudden you start doubting, oh my gosh, I thought that I, would, I, I didn't have that in my budget. And then God would be the one to step in at that moment and save you and say, hey, remember, I'm, I'm your provider, do you see? So it's, it's, it's what happens in our lives. Because, um, sister... sister um, Lavelle, I think you had something to say. Okay, okay, thank you. There's, there's, there's. Um, did you, did you want to speak? Up? Yeah, I would have showed. Just, just a quick point as well. Um, the question asks about uh, what is to say about Peter. What it says about him as well, as Sister Liz said, another elder Ellis said, um, he speaks to his faith that amongst all the group of disciples that were in the boat, he stepped out and was willing to test Absolutely. this situation, put it to the Absolutely. test. So he speaks a lot to his character. But there's something else I was going to say as well, in keeping with the theme of the lesson, mm. about his, um, what do you call it, him being under construction as well. Remember, there was only with Messiah for three years, right? Mm -hmm. So this was, from all accounts of Scripture, a first-time episode of such situation, do you see? Mm. So this was going to be a learning lesson for him as well. So, so... There I suggest that it, 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 it trained him from this experience how to address matters of faith yeah. going forward. So this was going to be a building block, a first-time lesson, a faith 101 sort of module. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so it's no shame for him to have asked for proof or asked for um, showing that. Remember, you know, Jesus was a common man like him from down the road. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. So to follow his ministry and step out in faith like that, I want the lecturer that's teaching me, well, let's go to a, do a science experiment and show me that you could actually walk on water. Do you see? Yeah. So it was no shame. But if you look at verse 31, Jesus Christ speaking in the spirit now. So this is where the definitive answer is. Verse 31 says, mm. and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So Jesus definitively spoke that you were being doubtful. Mm. And that's what's happened. And Funny you say about the bailiff letters and all that, because I'm experiencing something like that right this minute. Mm. And this lesson is even encouraging me now as well. So it's an untimed lesson in the spirit mm. that is doubt. There's no other definitive, no other view. It's yeah. Jesus Christ said in the spirit that you were doubtful. Yes, yes. And because we, we tend to look at things through the lens of rational and reason. Yeah. And Absolutely. daring and doubt sets problem. in. Yes, yes. And Another lens we look through things on is previous experience. We've never done this module before. we never had this experience before. Yeah. So it can't be what we've seen with our eyes. That's why the word says, eyes have not seen and our ears have not heard. Yeah. One of the prophecies of Messiah in Isaiah mm. is that he won't deal with things by his eyes sight. and ears, yeah. by sight. He deals with things by the spirit. And that's yeah. why the, the introduction to the lesson says, Flesh and blood couldn't have revealed what you learned just now, Peter. It's the amen. spirit that reveals it. Amen and amen. Yes, thank you, Elder Sherwood. Yes. Um, just to put a bed to it, because we spent some time, and I like, obviously, all the discussion that we had on it, but there's, an important, there's a point that, I, I just hold your point, please, brother side. Um, there's a, there's a, let's go through it line by line, just to, just to make this very clear. What, do the, what, did the, what does these passages reveal about the kind of person Peter was in relation to the other disciples? Well, if we go first and foremost, to verse 26, it says, And when the disciples saw him walking on water, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out of fear. Right? So who does it say was fearful? The disciples, collectively. And they would have been very happy to leave it at, This ain't of God, this is a spirit, this is a bad situation. They would have been happy to leave it there. 
including everybody. All, everybody collectively would have left it as there. Jesus then called out saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Right? And it says, and Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me that you let me walk on water. What does that show about Peter likewise? One, he understood the power of God. We ain't, we ain't going to ask. It's like Elijah, for example. Would you ask, um, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you? That's where we, last time, the three Elijahs, yes. Would, if Elijah said, if I be a man of God, same thing, by the way. See that big if? If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you. What happens? Fire comes down and consumes them. Do you see? And that's a big if. Do, do, do you see that? Because he knew the power of God. He had faith in God. If, put it like this even now. If we want a sign from God, are we going to say, God, if it's you speaking to me, let me defy the laws of nature because I know only you possess the power to defy the laws of nature. That, that would be valid proof for me to believe, yes, it's you that I'm seeing. That's a big ask. So for him to say, Lord, if it be you, let me defy the laws of gravity and be able to walk on water. Yeah. If it be you. If it be you. And then when he said, hear it, he says, um, and when the disciples, um, verse 20, where am I, 28? And verse 29 says, and he said, come. That's what he said. He said one word, come. He didn't say, yes, it is me. It's Lord that I made everything. He didn't give him a big performance or a big presentation to show it's him. All he said is, come. What does he do now? Verse 29 I'm at, of uh, Matthew 14. At that point, it says, when, Pe and when Peter was come down out of the ship, now bear that in mind as well. It, it, to come down out of a ship and to reach the water isn't an easy task. That's going to take some faith for you to do. Jumped out, leaped out. It, it was a very risky thing for him to do. On the one premise of hearing some, a spirit that everybody thinks is an evil spirit, to say, come. And then he's like, okay, I know that God has the ability to defy the laws of gravity. I'm going to trust him and go. So that is some deep, this is, de this is deep on the behalf of Peter. Yet again, it's something that we overlook. We, would you jump out of a... I, 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 I wouldn't. If he said, I wouldn't ask him to, for me to test if I can walk and walk. I would say, I'm all right. I'll believe you from here. He said, come. Do you see what I'm saying? That's deep. That's great faith. Yet again, it's just like us. Like with Abraham, even the father of faith. We see many people, we see many people start off well. They get a bit shaky. God steps in and saves them. And then they do better going on. I'm sure after this, Peter was a better person for it. And the same is true for us today. On the back of him coming down, he started, but yet again, then uh, the situation changed. The environment changed. Once you start seeing the water splashing, as um, Brother Darren said, this is a fisherman that's seen many winds in his life, but this was a different type of wind that really changed the situation for him. Many of us yet likewise, situations God has been brought us through before. Um, how was it? God made that skip over you, Sister Genevieve. It came off the stand. Um, it's... it's Different. It, it, yet again, we can be we can be delivered from many things, illnesses or bad situations, but it could be one situation that would change your faith. There's levels of faith. Rose in. Yes. And not before. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So in that moment, and and yet again, this is this is what we have to remember in anything that we're trusting God with. Um, many a times, trust me, even in my life, thinking back, many a times when I, I even know God's in something and God's done it and I have verification. And then later on, you start doubting once a, a, a situation changes in that same thing that you know God's blessed you with. Be it a job, you know God's given you that job. It's a miracle how you've got the job. And then later on, once you start getting performance reviews or whatever, then you start thinking, oh my gosh, now nah, maybe this ain't my job. But you literally go back and start doubting because the situations now change. It's no longer smooth sailing. And that happens to every single one of us. Uh, Elder Ellis. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, Elder Ellis, before you, sorry, Brother Saeed had um, something to say, then we'll, go, then we'll move to question two. Um, yeah, I wanted to add an extra layer in terms of the fact that Peter asked to be able to walk on the water as well. In the Jewish tradition, a rabbi and a student, the student has to be 
willing to become exactly like their rabbi. They have to imitate them. Mm. So as a teacher, if he's seeing that he's walking on water and he's asking, let me walk on water as well. He's saying basically, because of the way this setup is, mm. I need to do exactly as you do. If you're my rabbi, I need to do this. Okay. I need to be able to do this as well. Okay. Well. And also, I wanted to point out... It's a good um, point. First John chapter 2, verse 6. Mm. We always talk about walking as he walks. So, for example, it says, He that saith he abideth in him ought to himself also walk even as he walked. Yes. So and it's that's kind an interesting of, thing, yeah. Yeah. So it's quite it's, literal in this. Quite literal example. in this, um, in the miracle sense. Mm. But spiritually, that's what it's talking about. Yes, yes. You have to do exactly as, as God does. for the sick, this, the that, yeah. And everything. it's the reason why we keep the Sabbath as well. You're following the pattern yes, that yes. God has set. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're walking as he walked. Yeah, absolutely. No, good points. Really good points. And good bit to bring out there with the rabbi um, student element as well. Um, Elder Ellis, I then question two. Um, we know there's an act of faith, and we also know there's enduring faith. Mm. And okay. um, we have to know the voice of God, as Abraham did, in order to act out that faith. Yeah. So the disciple, they know Christ before he was walking on the water. Yeah. So when Christ said, I am he, Peter recognized that voice. So it was permanent for him to step out without mm. any doubt. Yeah. But as I said before, as the wind become, began to get boisterous, mm. then his faith failed there. But you have to behold Christ and cries out. Mm. So I think this has been written for our learning to understand that even though we may claim Christ, mm. are following Christ, when the going go tough, yeah. we must still have that enduring faith. Yeah, amen, amen, very true. Because yet again, the response of Christ was very, well, it was quite severe, if you will. He said, O ye of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? That sounds very, that's very direct and very, the expectation of God is why did you, why did you fail coming this far, DC? Um, so it's, it's, it's serious stuff. It's very serious stuff. But humanly speaking, it's understandable. It's understandable, humanly speaking, and we shouldn't judge. Likewise, even with Thomas, he's not a doubting Thomas. Once he believed, Amen. he was ready. That's all he needed. He had proof. Likewise with us, we need proof. If God speaks or God's told you something, it's not wrong to be as Gideon and say, God, if that was you, then let the fleece be wet. Okay, God, this one time, let it be the other way around if it's you. Now you have verification, and if you don't act with that verification, that's a serious problem now because you have verification. It's God, and you still don't believe, and that's serious unbelief. Do you see? So, yes. We should be people that are seeking proof, seeking proof. Even what you see, okay, does that match the scriptures? Is that in the scriptures? If it's not, don't believe it. It doesn't matter if a spirit walks in the air tomorrow. Be as, the, be as Peter, where he says, if it be you, Lord, I need proof to know it's you. Amen? And we should be that type of Christian, as the scriptures admonish us. Um, question two, how does Matthew 26, 75 and so 74 and 75, hint at their second beatitude, blessed are they that mourn, in Peter's discipleship journey. Uh, let's have a read there, uh, Matthew 26, verses 27, so I say 74 and 75, if I can have someone to read that for us as well, please. 74. Then, then he began, then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Amen. Amen. Now, how does that speak to the beatitude that speaks of blessed are they that mourn? Was he mourning that somebody died? How does it speak to blessed are they that mourn? Because Peter knew that he had done something wrong, so it actually was mourning and asking for forgiveness. Yes, yes, amen. Um, and let's just bear this in mind as well. This is Peter 
Um, well, we know of his end, for example, but let's not even go into that because we're going to talk about that later on. Um, but this is Peter who, moments earlier, was willing to strike off somebody's ear to fight for his Lord. He, he, was, he was, and you know, there's some acts you do. I remember this as a young man, by the way. Seriously, I probably shouldn't say it, but you know, I say it to the glory of God. But there's some, there's some acts you do that there's no going back. <laughs> yeah, confession's good for the soul. But there's that moment sometimes where if you're getting into a little ruckus with somebody, the moment you can throw a punch, you're thinking, oh, my days. Inside, you're thinking, oh, my days. That's it. We're fighting now because you've, it's done. So think about how Peter felt. The moment he got his sword and struck the man's ear off, it's not like a slap. He could say, oh, no, do not. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Sorry, excuse me. He cut the man's ear off. If it wasn't for Jesus able to mend it instantly back, that would have been it. You're now fully involved in the arrest, fully involved. So he was, he was somebody that was truly believing that he wouldn't forsake the Lord. And he was, very, he was, he was willing to, you know, to go with God. But now the realization came to him, or a realization came to him, let's say. Once he said, look, what did they say all before? I would never deny you. Did they not say at the Last Supper? Many of us can say, Lord, I'll never. Do you get what I'm saying? Many, even many, diff many sins we could even commit. You could say, Lord, I'll never do that. And then you end up committing it, like what Peter said, um, Paul, sorry. Um, not uh, Brother Paul here, Apostle Paul. <laughs> Your head shot up like, what did I say? <laughs> when he said that the, the things that I hate, that I do. Do you see, Peter hated the idea of denying Christ, but he ended up doing it. He ended up doing it, and then once the realization said, oh my gosh. And this is why it's really important for us, especially this example here when it comes to the end times that we're entering into. Many of us will say, I'll never get the mark of the beast. I'll never. If the government cut me off, as in from civilization, put me in prison, then after that going to threaten me with beheadment, um, being beheaded, I'm still going to be for Christ. And COVID, for example, many people saw that once the government makes some edicts, all of a sudden... Things change. Instant, like that. And we couldn't picture it. We would never would have saw that coming before. And yet again, we'll say, no, I've never stopped that. I've never, I'm going to Christ. Do you see? So the point I'm trying to say is, Peter was in that sort of example. In himself, he thought that, no, I'll never do that. But the realization came to him that he wasn't one as strong or as righteous as he thought he was. And he wept biblically. So when the Beatitude is talking about blessed are they that mourn, the same stands true for us as disciples under construction. There's going to be times when we don't do things that we should have done. He should have stood with Christ, but he didn't. There's going to be times when you do things that you shouldn't do, and you know that it's displeasing to God, and it should, it should make you deeply touched. Deeply touched. It should make you weep, weep bitterly. Brother Paul. Oh, sorry, Sister Dio. Excuse me. Sorry. Thank you, Brother. Sister Dio. Um, that's when we make permanent decision only based on temporary motion that pass. Because something happened and you snap temporary. Mm. Yeah. But then that passes and you can't take it back. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that is, that's a really true point and a practical bit of life. Don't make, don't make d decisions off emotions and it, it can ultimately change the course of your life. Uh, uh, this is teaching us that we cannot rely on self. Paul said, I can do nothing. But through Christ, that strengthened me, I can do all things. Amen. And we see in Peter's case here, when he cut the, the ears of the man off mm. and Christ amended it, it shows that Christ was delivering from being arrested. Yes. But Peter yes. couldn't see that mm. because he was so bound up in self. Yeah. He still go ahead and deny Christ. Yeah. But... This is to teach us that we are for ourselves, we can do nothing. We have to stay focused and allow Christ to live out his life through us. Yeah. And able us to stand any wind that comes. Amen and amen. Amen, absolutely. The, 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 that stands absolutely true. The, the, the moral of the story is do not trust in yourself. That's part of mourning. Once you come to the realization that you mourn your own state. I am, I, oh wretched man that I am. I can't say it better than Apostle Paul. Oh, wretched man that I am. And yet again, I think sometimes we can say this stuff as church platitude. And we say, oh, you got to, I'm saved by Jesus. What a wreck I am. And, you know, but to really understand 
that you are a wreck. You are, you are wretched, um, but for the grace of God. It sounds, quite, it sounds quite depressing to say that, by the way, but I actually find it quite encouraging that I don't need to trust in myself. Really, I don't have to trust in myself. I, I, I can trust in God. You know, it's better, it's better to have that mentality, to be depressed because, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm weak and I need someone else. No, I'd rather be weak and rely upon someone stronger. Amen? All right, Sister Michelle. Good morning, church. Good morning. Blessed Sabbath to you all. Thank you. Blessed Sabbath. Brother Anthony. Um, I just want to pick up on the point of the distinction that Yeshua must have been making when he looked at Peter currently in his actions and knowing the end of Peter and what Peter would come to do for the mm. kingdom of God. And I think, um, as with Christ, as you were speaking, um, I was reminded of the Garden of Gethsemane when Yeshua himself said to Elohim, Could you take this cup from me, Father? Could you? Mm. And then he said, not my will, but your own. So even at the point of death, of knowing that he would fulfill the Father's will, he still was mourning. He was still mourning. Mm. And so Jesus is showing us the difference between human personality and divine character. And I think that's what we need to really look at in the life of Peter when we're analyzing his journey mm. uh, to maturity and the reason why he was selected and why Yeshua said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There was something about Peter's personality. Yes, we could say he was rash for chopping off the guy's ear and not thinking about the consequences. But God chose him, still. Because in his human frailty, he demonstrated his love for Christ. So sometimes our wrong actions, what we consider to be wrong, we, we don't know if that's the judgment that the Lord put on him. That's our own interpretation of that action. Um, Jesus was quick to mend it because he was able to see the consequences, but that doesn't mean that that display of affection for the Messiah was wrong. So I do want us to be careful in how we're analyzing Peter's personality mm. and how Christ analyzes divine character. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's a good point because, yet again, even with these things, focusing on the positive, you can see that it shows good intentions and good character. That could be worked upon. Do you see? Yet again, it's, you, you can argue um, how somebody handles something. You know, if a mother turns up at a school gate and wants to fight a child that's bullying their child, you know, you can, you can, you can question the intents of that mother doing that and is that the right thing to do? But the, her, the sincerity and she's doing it out of love for the love of her child and what's, you know, just as a random example that comes to my mind. So do you understand what I'm saying? It's not the right thing to do, but it's understandable. If somebody's bullying your child, is, is you, you see. Kind of like, yeah, the motive. The, the, the motive shows that he's is not it, just doing it for... Is it kind yeah. of like Paul, mm. when he was like killing Christians, and Jesus said to was it Jesus that said to him, why do thou persecute me? Yeah. But God saw the motive Absolutely. of his heart. Absolutely rather than what he was doing, Amen. which was wrong. Absolutely. Amen. That he was somebody zealous for the, for the church. Absolutely. So the characteristic is, was good, but it was wrongly applied. Same thing with Peter here. The characteristic was good, but it was wrongly applied. Do you see? But God still sees that and says, you know what? You mean well. Um, there's an interesting thing. I'm surprised it's not in the lesson study here, but to speak of the brokenness of Peter even before, I mean, Luke 5 verses 8, um, bear in mind, mourning comes after the brokenness. Right? If we're talking about it in the order of the Beatitudes, number one, even before we talk about Peter being a mournful person, mourning his sin and his own character, the brokenness even comes before. When he first met Jesus in Luke 5, um, verses 8, it says, Peter speaking, he fell at the feet of Jesus and said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. 
there and first and foremost. So Peter, first and foremost, was a broken person. He was broken and had a, had a contrite heart. He understood who he was. Do you see? As a broken man, even when he first met Christ, because if he first met Jesus and said, oh, Lord, I'm a righteous man. I've been um, listening to John the Baptist for many years with my brother, and we're all fishermen. If he, if he came with that spirit, then he's not a broken person. But he understood who he was. So when he f came into contact with the Lord, he said, I'm a broken man. He, he was The first beatitude it starts with, even for us, is to be broken. Understand that you are sinful. Understand that you ain't good. Understand all of those things. After which you mourn your sin, like Peter showed in this example when he failed. Um, question three now, we're going to be talking about the meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That part, that part of the beatitude, how does Peter evidence this in his life? Um, the, qu the question says, meekness is about surrender and submission to the will of God. Forsaking our desire to call the shots in our life. So let's remember meekness from that perspective. Yet again, as we spoke many a weeks, meekness is similar, and obviously meekness involves humility, because if I act meek in meekness and surrender my life to the will of God, I must be humble enough to know that I don't know the best for my own life, for example. Um, but meekness isn't humility, but they're closely related. Meekness is, as it says here, meekness is about surrender. Once you've realized you're broken, once you mourn your path, your sin, your shortcomings and failures like Peter did when he, you know, f denied Christ. Meekness now is once you come to that realization, I'm going to submit myself going forward, not to what I want to do, not my career, not the wife I want to marry, not the job I want to do, but what does God want me to do? That's, that's the meekness we're talking about. When it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Here it now, the question asks, are these elements of this beatitude in the account of John 21? See verses 15 to 19, paying close attention to Peter's final answer in verses 17. And yet again, this is another passage which can be read from a negative only lens. Um, but it, yet again, is, it shows good characteristics and positive things we can take from it in the life of Peter. Um, verses 15 to 19, if I can have a volunteer to read that for me, please. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Amen. Amen. Yes, wonderful reading. Um, this, is, um, this is another interesting passage, if we talk about it as an example of Peter's meekness. But even if you go before in the context of this, because we read um, when they had dined, um, the story goes in the preceding verses. We see that um, the disciples, Peter said, I'm going to go fishing, right? Bear in mind, in the context of all this stuff, it's almost like he's returning to his old life. Or, you know, the Messiah that they thought was going to restore the kingdom to Israel has died, um, so forth, you know, the whole disappointments and stuff. He's gone back and says, look, I go fishing. Um, in that moment, a um, person who they didn't know was Jesus at the time said, look, cast the net on the other side. He goes and does that. There's a great multitude of fish that they draw in. What does Peter do there? 
It says he was so excited that he ran out to meet the man, saying, it's the Lord. He instantly recognized this time. You notice a parallel to what happened before? What happened before when they met a spirit? They didn't know. Do you see? But this time, this person who didn't, they didn't say they was Jesus, another person totally looks totally different, told them something, spoke to them, and this time he recognized, no, that's the Lord. Ran out so fast that he couldn't put his clothes on, it says. He ran out naked. Ran naked and, long story short, on the back of that great multitude of fish, now they're dining. So that's the context behind it. So it also, it's almost like it's mirroring that what Peter was like at that time before, but we read about in Matthew 14. That he, obviously, he, the path and the faith has now increased. He can now recognize God and so forth, right? But how does this passage here show meekness in his life? Has anybody picked up how the meekness is shown in this? Uh, Elder Paul. Um, what I understand from this is that Peter denies the Lord three times, so um, Christ um, asks him three times in his restoration, love us, don't me more than these. Mm. And um, he answers, yeah, Lord, I love thee, recognizing who he's speaking to. Mm. And he also, in the last question that Jesus asks, he says, don't know us all things recognizing in his divinity, mm. um, God in Christ. So we see Peter answer correctly. He was restored, and Christ gave him the mandate to feed the sheep. Mm. Amen. Amen. Yes, and, and that's even something that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, um, could, could we definitively say, and it's a question for ourselves, I don't want to answer, but could we definitively say, imagine you walked and talked with God on earth, Christ right there, and he said that, do you love me? He asks you a question, and you can definitively say, you know all things. You know I love you with the utmost priority above everything else. That's what Peter did, which is commendable, to have that confidence to say, Lord, you know all things. You can read my heart. You, you can read my intentions. You know you're the number one in my entire life above everything else. And remember what I said, Peter was a married man, as the passages show. He was a married man. Amongst, obviously, other things he must have had in his life, it shows that he correctly loved Christ above everything else. And he was confident enough to say, look, you know, you know my heart. Uh, Sister Michelle. Thank you. Um, I just want to take us back to when Peter first identified thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Mm. Um, so this isn't the, the, the time when Peter first acknowledges who the Messiah is. He was the first disciple when they were saying, you know, who do you say that I am? And saying Isaiah, and, you know, some say this and some say a prophet. Mm. And Peter was the first apostle, as we know him now, to identify the Christ. Mm. And it was important that he said the Christ, um, the son of the living God. So... This isn't the first time, so I just want us to be aware of that. Um, yes, uh, Elder John, is it? Paul. Elder Paul, sorry, um, said that th this passage was about restoration. Three times he denied the Lord, and three times he confessed his love for the Lord. I don't want us to read too much um, or exaggerate what he says. He just says, Lord, you know I love thee. We put in our own take on the priority of that love. Um, he just says, thou knowest I love thee. Yeah. And again, he's saying, you know all things. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Mm. So the meekness was there from the beginning because he identified who Christ was from the very beginning. Mm. Although we see this tumultuous journey of up and down, I think it's for us to show us that in this journey of life that we have, we're not going to go up the mountain of the Beatitudes and down mm. seamlessly. We're going to have times when we're going up and down, depending on what phase of life we're in, dep depending on the context of our situation. You know, people are losing loved ones. You might have thought that you was down here, you know, serving the Lord, but you might find yourself back on the other side of the mountain 
because of loss and tragedy. Do you see what I mean? So it's not in our lifetime we're going to go up and down the mountain of the Beatitudes once. No. Of course. And yeah. Peter's journey shows us that. Mm. You know, he was back and forth um, again because of the human personality which God has given to us. Yeah. And it shows us just how kind Elohim is to us that he would patiently wait for us to go up and down, to go up and down, to go up and down. But he sees his character in us from the beginning, hence why he selected the disciples that he did. Yeah. So let's not disqualify him because he identified Christ and so he lost his meekness and then he got it back again. Mm. No. He's just showing us the journey of humanity and how we walk with the Lord. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Sister Michelle. Um, so here we see... The meekness is shown in um, verse 15, first and foremost. Verse 15, if we go through this, it says, um, So when he had dined, Jesus said unto Simon, Peter, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? So yet again, that's a big question. Bear in mind, he didn't say, do you love me? He said, do you love me more than these? One may say, imagine that's a question being asked you, by the way. You'll think, why are you even asking me that question? But anyway, Jesus said, do you love me more than these? The people that he was with, his friends and people that he knew. The meekness is shown in what Jesus told him to do. What did Jesus tell him to do? Feed my lambs. That's where the meekness is. Remember, meekness, according to this, meekness is about surrender and submission to God's will, forsaking our desire to call the shots in our lives. What was he doing and where was he? What was the setting and where he was at? He went fishing. He went back to what he knew. He was fishing, he was eating fish with Christ and his friends and people that he knew, probably family there, doesn't say. Um, but the meekness is shown in that he was willing, yet again, to forsake what he knew and his now life's purpose is to feed Christ's lambs. Amen? That's where the meekness is shown. The, the, what, now what are you... What's, he, he didn't go back and say, oh, I'm going to be a fisher. Feed people... No, feed my lambs. Amen? That was the call. Um, it goes on multiple times he said that. And every single time he responds yet again, feed my sheep. The third time he says, what? Follow me. So all of that is not is, is talking about you are no longer going to be living for you. You're going to be a meek person like Moses. Remember we spoke about Moses being a prime example of meekness, the meekest man in the earth, the Bible says, who forsook even Moses, matter of fact, done the same thing. He forsook what he knew as a, well, first and foremost, as a prince, many say, in Egypt, and a mighty man of war and knowledge as extra um, biblical information gives. And then he forsook that to spend 40 years as a what? Shepherd. 40 years as a shepherd, very similar to thing. And there's something about these... Jobs, by the way, biblically, if you picked up the pattern, yeah. David was a shepherd. Yes. All these people, they always have some form of animal, Peter, fisherman, all these stuff is, is I don't know, maybe we're in the wrong businesses, to be honest. <laughs> but, yeah, but this is where I was going to go. You, you stole the landing for me. So he took Moses from now being a shepherd, providing for Jethro and his daughters in the wilderness for 40 years. Think about that for a second. We think that just was a little blip in his life before he met the burning bush. 40 years, it says he was out there doing that. So he was set in that life now. And then 40 years, now he was in the wilderness with the children of Israel, now being a shepherd of God's people. Amen. So he literally, multiple times, forsook what he wanted to do, even in the very beginning. And many of us, I'm sure, have that very experience. I personally do, if I'm being honest, where you're in essence, asked to do something for God. And your initial response is, I'm not adequate to do that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a shepherd. Well, he, this man was a prince and a leader in Egypt before, and he still thought, I'm not adequate to lead people. I can't speak. I, I'm, not, I'm not qualified. So yet again, we see that humility was there, and then the meekness was shown in the fact that he was now going to be a vessel to do what the Lord wants him to do. Amen. 
So we see that exact same pattern here um, with Peter. So yet again, it shows even for us, if we're looking at ourselves as disciples under construction, the call of God is to get to that point. Once you've gone through that brokenness, once you've gone through that mourning, once you've gone through, um, what's the other one that we're looking for? Um, brokenness. Help me out here. Poor in spirit, yeah, broken and poor in spirit, yes. Number two, remind me, what's number two? Or the Beatitudes? Is it more? Okay. Let's, let's go back for it. Well, we've, been, we've, been, we've only been on this for a quarter of a year, brethren. <laughs> let's go back for it. It's important that we get it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I'm in uh, Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Okay, we're on number three. Blessed are they that, that meek, the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So it was actually on number three then. So now going on to number four and question four, uh, it says, blessed are they which hunger and thirst for righteousness. Matter of fact, this actually skips that. Uh, yes, yeah, Sister Liz? It is helpful to go back to question, to question three. Okay. And just to look at verse 18, does that hold any significance of being meek uh, and not we, holding, calling the shots in his life. Because the Lord said to him, really, really, yeah, I please. could be wrong. Really, really, I say unto thee, because the Lord is basically telling him, and he uh, calls him to being humble as amen. well. Really he good says, really, uh, really, I said unto thee, when thou was young, yeah. thou girdest thyself mm. and walkest whether thou wouldest. But mm. when thou behold, this and this is going to happen to you. You can stretch forth your hand in thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whether thou wouldest not. Yeah. And when, while, after the Lord finished talking so to him, he said, death. follow me. And he chose to follow the Lord. And yeah. because he made his mind, well, now I no longer hold the shots in my life. Whatever the will of God is, that what it's, it is Imagine. for me. And he chose to follow the Lord. Amen. On. Amen. Mm. Amen. Yes. I, how can I miss that? I even get goosebumps. Every single time I read this passage here, um, it's, it's amazing. A beautiful example of meekness. Verse 19 literally gives you the rounding or the summary of all of it. It says, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, follow me. So imagine that for a moment. Imagine living your life knowing the way you're going to die, first and foremost. I mean, it's probably not a good thought to think, but sometimes you wonder, but how, what's going to be my end? How you, how, what's going to be my end? How am I going to die? But Peter lived, in essence, on death row, knowing that he is going to be killed in a not pleasant way for what purpose it says the death that he should do to to glorify god imagine that everybody every single person as even jeremiah says in the book of jeremiah it says that god gives us an expected end in other words we all want to live peaceably we want to have a peaceable death dying in peace right an expected end what you expect your end to be here we see he was told that the will for you, in the will I have for you, is for you to die as a martyr. That's what he's being told. When you was old, you done, when you was young, you done what you wanted to do. You went where you wanted to go. You lived the life as you saw fit. But when you're old, you're going to be literally imprisoned, bound, as a, as a person on death row, going to die as well. You're not going to be delivered from that. And he said that you're going to, it's going to be the death that I want for you. Imagine that. Serious meekness for him to accept that and just live his life. Uh, brother, uh, Elder Paul, sorry. Um, the following was not just to follow as they go daily in their walk, mm. but a complete journey yeah. with Christ Amen. through his lifetime. Yeah. And he will face death as Christ did also. Wow. And the task that Jesus gave him to feed the sheep was not half himself. But as he follow Christ, Amen. he'll be able to accomplish the task. Amen. 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 Absolutely. And that's where the meekness comes in yet again, because meekness is that I can't do it except you are with me. Except the Lord's with me, I can't do this task. You know, Moses, yet again, going back to him, he said that he can't do it. And if the Lord's with him, in other words, and he will, he will go. Um, question four, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Um, how did Peter see Jesus in ways the other disciples didn't? How do Matthew 
uh, 16, verses 13 to 19, and Luke 5, verses 7 and 8, point to this? How does it show that G uh, Matthew saw Jesus in other ways that the other disciples didn't? Verse 13. If I can have a volunteer to read, please. Uh, Matthew 6, sorry, 16. Oh, sorry. So that's Matthew 16. We are reading 13 to 19. Yes, please. So it says, 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias and some Jeremiah, or others of the or other prophets. He said unto them, By whom say he that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood art not revealed it unto thee but my Father which is in heaven. Amen. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give thee unto thee the keys of the heaven, sorry, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shall lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Amen, amen. Thank you, Sister Liz, for reading. This is an interesting passage. Again, one maybe that you never thought about in this light. Um, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Remember what we saw about pure in heart? Um, somebody, anybody, summarize what is pure in heart? Simply put, according to what we have studied, what is the pure in heart that we're talking about according to the Beatitude? Blessed are the pure in heart. Anybody? Simply, what, what, what is pure in heart? I mean, I sure hope that we, you know, I don't say it to put anyone on the spot, but I want us to regurgitate the information. You know, it's really important once you go for a study, even this is where meditation comes in. That the more you think on something is the more these things churn and it comes concrete in your mind becomes conceptualized uh elder paul uh, you wasn't I, here but if you I, I, I don't know the study you had uh, that's yeah but my understanding of being having a pure heart god promised that he will write his law in our inner world you know write his law in our heart and mm. we know that law is a law of love mm. so if you have love for god and your fellow men that signify that your heart has been purified Okay, yes, absolutely. It definitely includes that. Um, yes, uh, Sister Jennifer, you've definitely includes that. Um, that is um, having a heart with um, the anger, bitterness, guile, revenge, and having our thoughts fixed on Christ. Yes. So that um, when he's within us, our thoughts are within him, and we live more peaceable with each other, and we're conscious Amen. of how we, what we do and what we say because of um, within the heart, out of the heart comes All the goodness of the heart, comes what we say and do. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes, amen, amen. Yes, uh, it, 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 in, in short, it's talking about sincerity of heart, true intentions, true, um, what, what, how do you put it? If you're talking about sincerity of heart, for example, yeah, true motives, that's, the, that's a good word to use there, absolutely. True motives, sincerity, sincerity of heart. When we, yeah, when we, we go back and just have a skim read, in your own time, maybe not now, but of that lesson study. But when we talk about pure in heart, it's talking about, one, not wanting to get vengeance, as Sister Genevieve spoke about. It's what is, in essence, pleasing to God you would do, as much as live life and you live peaceably of all men. To do that, you have to have a pure heart to do so and true intentions of sincerity. You see, to love, as Brother Paul brought out there, you have to sincerely want to love because God wants you to love. It's deep to go back into, but sincerity of heart is talking about true intentions, no agenda, motives, purely to please God, in my own words. 
Um, Brother Sayyid. Sorry, I was just going to say, would you say authentic? Yes, yeah. that's a good word, yeah. Absolutely, authentic, amen. Okay. Because the Bible says that many walk of whom I say unto you are the enemies of the cross. What's that talking about? It's so much, there's many unauthentic Christians. Do you see? The, the, so there's Christians that may not be pure in heart. We don't want to be that type of Christian. Um, Sister Tracy, I haven't heard from you all day, so I, I wouldn't skip over you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction as well. <laughs> In this sense, um, something just said to me that Peter, for he to say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I believe all along he was focused. Okay. His eye was focused on everything, every character, everything of Jesus. So because he was so focused, God could put it in his spirit, mm. reveal unto him that he could say that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And when it go down, he, say, um, he said that upon this rock, because he was so focused, he said, upon this rock will mm. I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail yeah. against it. So I believe he was just focused. He never take his eye. Every little thing Jesus do. He high was there. He, he's like Elijah and Elisha, you know? Mm. <laughs> you know, he, he, he was focused. Mm. And that's why he got the mantra. Amen? So yeah. this saw with the Peter revelation. and Jesus. Amen. Now, well, well, that's a, that, well now, that, now, that's a good point to bring out, especially on the passage that we're going to dissect on the screen, where it says, for they shall see God. <coughs> right? Amen. Okay. Amen. So as, as, the, as, the, as the father revealed it to Peter, Amen. now we dissect it with that light. Now, all the, who, so firstly, who did Jesus ask the question to? What does the scripture say that he asked it, the question to? Yes, thank you, thank you. Absolutely, he said to his disciples, saying, who do men say I am? So it was a collective thing. Everybody was asked, cite me asking the question out. Who do men say that I am? And then somebody answers. Do you see? Which was a supreme answer. Yeah. He recognized God's divinity. He recognized Jesus' divinity. You know, you know what came to mind? What came to mind? And I don't know if this has any bearing. But even the Canaanite woman recognized who Jesus was yeah. by saying, Son of David. Mm. Yeah. And, and Jesus saw that as great faith, that she recognized maybe his kingship. Yeah. I don't know if I'm on the right path here. No, you, you know you are actually. You, you actually are with that. I don't want to go into that because that's an interesting thing to deep dive into. But interestingly, that speaks to his response as well. Why he spoke to her as it's not meat to give the children of the the, the the bread of the children of the kingdom to dogs. Yeah. Because she wasn't actually under the jurisdiction of the kingdom of Israel as a Canaanite woman, Peter as you mentioned. Christ but but it showed one. great faith. Her response says even the crumbs. That's why Jesus said, oh, great is your faith. Do you see? But yet again, let's not go into that, but it's a good example yet again. Um, here we see, okay, Brother Said, I think you had something to say on that. Sorry, I just want to say in um, how I envision this passage. So it's kind of like when Jesus asked, who do men say that they are, I am? It's kind of like I always envision that he's sitting down with his disciples and then he's kind of like, okay, so what's the, what's the word around town? Uh, what, what are people saying? What's the yeah. rumors? Yeah. And then they can say, oh, they're saying this, they're saying that, they're that. And he's saying, okay, so that's their perspective. Mm. But how are you seeing things? Me. How, do you, how do you see me? Yeah. Kind of thing. What, yeah, do what, you do you think, think? what do you think about me? Then? Yeah, what do you guys think about me? That's how I envision it. No, yeah, yeah, it's good, yeah. Absolutely, I'm going to say that you're wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like reading a story. Everybody would envision the encounter in their own head. I've never actually thought about how it looked, but that's an interesting thing. Maybe they're just relaxing. I don't know. But it says about Philippi, that much we know. Um, Brother Paul. Uh, the list is trying to tell us that. God will always reveal himself to every sincere heart who is searching to know who he is. Amen. 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 Absolutely. And that's where it's landing. Um, it says that many people, so notice this as we go through it. Verse 41, uh, sorry, verse 14 of Matthew 16 says, some say, so they're all saying some say, some say, yeah? Some say this, some say that. You know, it's, it's, it's 
you know, not much of a, you know, it's, it's just there, it's ambiguous. Verse 15, it says, what he said unto them, yet again, he's speaking to the collective, but okay, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon, now, so now Simon as an individual, notice before it says, and they said, they say, some Elias, some Jeremiah, some whoever, whoever. But now when it comes to this, it's him that gave, he's, but now they was talking as, speaking as they. Everyone else was silent on this point now because they was unsure. But Peter was the one who says, thou art the Christ, do you see? So it was Peter that was the one who saw God, if you will. Amen. So just use your, uh, turn on your microphone, please. Me, that somebody ha that has a pure heart can see. Right. She used the word focus. Yeah. 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 Good word. Yeah. That's it, basically. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. No, good point. Yeah, good, good participation. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, again, if you're talking about disciples under construction. This is something, and matter of fact, it's good that you even that you caught the vision there because if we're talking about even us as individuals using this same pattern, who is it that God's going to give revelation to? Revelation. Who's God going to give revelation to? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So who's God going to give revelation to? The pure in heart. Amen. Now, if I'm here for whatever reasons for self, if I'm here for self, or I'm doing whatever I'm doing in my life for self, and I'm not pure in heart, remember just using pure in heart as authentic, you're an authentic Christian, the word says this, you're trying to live up to that, you're trying to think like that, your world perspective is based on the word and Christ, that God's going to give you the revelations. God's going to give you the things, the direction. Situations in life is going to happen, and you're going to see the hand of God in it. Do you see? We said that this, 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 this beatitude has not only a um, prophetic application that, yes, if you're pure in heart, once Christ returns, you're going to be in the kingdom of God and you're going to see him face to face. But it's talking about now, in your life, you're going to see God. Things happen to you and you're going to see what's God showing to you in that moment. Or, okay, how do I get better out of this situation? So you're seeing God on the day today. Amen. And it starts with being pure in heart, pure in the sense of being authentic. It don't mean you're going to be a perfect person, I see the hand. It don't mean that you're going to be a perfect person, but it's saying that you are seeking God. You want to hear what God says to you and you want to measure up to that. Amen? Very simple. And trust me, it sounds very simple, but unfortunately, if I'm being totally being honest, bear in mind, I don't know the hearts, but I think it's pretty evident in the action because the word says, by their fruits you shall know them. But it's unfortunate to see in Christendom nowadays... There's not many authentic Christians. And it's a big statement for me to stand in the church and say that, but it's true. Not many authentic. Many people come to church for all different reasons, to show off how good dressed they are, how much they can preach, or how much they can teach, or sing, dance, whatever. But the authentic heart. Remember Paul was said to be a man after God's own heart, but this man committed murder, adultery, lied, steal, everything. He literally, he broke all the Ten Commandments in that one act we know of him. <laughs> literally. I mean, that's not a joke. He actually really did. If you examine it carefully, he broke, it shows it was a perfect sin. He literally broke all the Ten Commandments in that one act. Nevertheless, it says that he was a man after God's own heart. So he, yes, he was weak. Yes, he had his failures. But the, uh, the intentions of his heart, he really wanted to know God, be with God. And that's what God saw. Yeah, that, we can't. that we can't see. Yeah. Do you see? So if there's anything to get, it's get that authenticity that you really want to see God, know God, and what God's showing you, know, you know? Uh, Sister Michelle. Yes, I just wanted to, uh, to, I can't remember where it is now. The scripture where uh, Yeshua perceives the heart of the Pharisees, although they're saying something else and doing something else, he perceives the motives and then the intents of the heart. And I think that's why Simon Peter was chosen, because... He didn't even see all that Christ had done, but he identified him as the Christ. That's not a, a small thing. I don't want us yeah. to miss that. It's not a small He's thing. He's the one, yeah. He is the anointed one, mm. the one that the law and the prophets. So just in that, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Yeah. He's saying everything that was spoken of about the Messiah right. from Genesis in the Garden of Eden, where it says Eve would crush. Mm. 
This is the revelation. So I'm getting excited. It's waking me up. <laughs> you know, I love the word. Just, you don't even have to go for the second part, the B part of that sentence. Just mm. thou art the Christ. Yeah. And he didn't even demonstrate the fullness of his anointing at yeah. that part. Simon Peter perceived. Yeah. He perceived mm. with purity. Yeah. And that's why the reward of upon this rock. Yes. I will build my church. Please, church, let that be. A, this is your lesson. I'm sorry, but let that be a lesson yeah. to us. Yeah, amen. amen. Let that be a, a real lesson to us. Amen. That Peter was nuts. For lack of a better term, yeah. For lack of, I'm being colloquial uh, yes, again. Yes, yes. yes. Do you understand? Mm. But Christ said, you are the candidate. I'm going to use. I'm going to use. Mm. Wow. I'm going to use you because you have perceived with your heart. Mm. And see that that word see is not this yes, yes, physical yes. eye. Of course. It's perception of the heart. Mm. When he says see, he's talking about the seeing. Yes, yes. The eyes of your heart, the eyes of your understanding. Yeah, yeah. Thou art the Christ. And that is what we need to be able to say. I mean, we're going to do nonsense on this earth. Mm. But as long as our heart and our motives are pure yes. towards the kingdom, he says, seek ye first the kingdom, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Peter, I'm going to shut up in a minute. I'm so sorry. Peter identified the king of the kingdom. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Amen and amen. It's very powerful when we look at it. Um, Sister Ropa, please. Bless the Lord, my dear. Uh, yes, is, is it on? Just flick it up, the light should be on. Praise the Lord, everyone. Bless Happy Lord. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. When I think of Peter, when I read, read about him, and, you know, and I think of him, and I think that is the relationship what you have with Jesus, you know? Yeah, because yeah. when you have that relationship with God, mm. He show you things. You can see, you know, and you know what displeased God. Yeah, mm. that is what I believe about Peter. When he say, Father, you know that I love you, you know, yeah. Yeah, amen, yeah. It says that, yeah, he, he was even confident of his relationship with God to say that. Amen and amen. Um, let's just dissect this passage a little bit here. Um, if we go to verses um, 17, let's just start there. And it says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Thou art Simon bar Jonah. Sorry, sorry, thank you, yeah, thank you. Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So, yet again, that's what we're talking about the seeing of God came in, revelation of God came in, even we can widen that out, even understanding of Scripture, the, 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 the things of God, you understand. And it says, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, what did he mean when he said that? Now, this is deeper. He's talking about even the honor and the privilege bestowed upon Peter. Now, we have to be careful how we understand this, because a great denomination, talking about the great universal church, understands this. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the, yeah. the great universal church. I was going to say situated in Rome, to make it clear. Because technically, the church is universal, but the, what Catholic means is universal. Um, understand this passage to mean um, that the church was built upon Peter himself. They use this passage to understand it as Peter was the first pope in this encounter, that Jesus said, you are now the person that the church is built upon. But we have to understand it in this context here. Um, in the Strong's Concordance, you can get a bit more information when he said, Thou art Peter. He said that thou art Cephas. Other passages in scripture says that Cephas means a little stone. So, in essence, if we say it from the meaning of his name, he says that thou, I sound to thee, that thou art a little stone, Peter, 
And upon this rock, Petra, that word is, talking about Christ himself is the Petra, the rock of ages. Do you see? So there's a difference. You read in the Strongs. The, the Peter is Petros. Petros, which means a little stone. A stone. So he's actually making the distinction. In this passage, what Christ is doing. Absolutely. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. Um, so, so he's actually making the comparison, as we know, that Peter was like a, he, and it's even credible that God is saying that you are a, you're of some substance, because a stone is stone. He didn't say that you're wood, you know, that can burn, but he said that you're a stone. So you, you're solid, but you're small in the grand comparison. Absolutely. And even the very ge geography or the topography of where he was, was actually to emphasize the point. Because the passage says that there was in where? A few verses back, it says it in the very beginning that, there you go. And if you look at where that place is, there's a massive encompassing rock, a mountain right there. So Jesus was even using the topography to, point the, to, the, to the point that you are a little stone and upon this rock, this great massive mountain behind me, speaking of himself, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Later on, we see that Peter was instrumental in the church in the day of Pentecost, that he was the one who gave the sermon and the 5,000 souls were added. So the fulfillment of that was Peter was instrumental in the establishment of the church of God. But it did not say that Peter is built upon him. It says that it, the keys of the kingdom is given unto you. Other passages show that the keys of the kingdom speak about the knowledge of God. To have the keys of the kingdom is to have the knowledge of the scriptures and to be the, the, the to exactly, to, out, to unlock the path to salvation. Um, uh, Elder Paul. Um, just to add to what you just said there, that Jesus Christ is indeed the rock, is the foundation, is the head of the church, mm. and uh, you cannot build anything on flesh. Amen. It has to build upon God who is unfallible. Amen. So Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, he's the rock. Amen. And um, Peter has been given the knowledge, the gospel, to preach so that souls may enter in God's kingdom. Yeah. So therefore, that's the key that unlocking the mystery of God as you give the word to the nation Amen. and man come to know who Jesus Christ is. Amen. So that's the key to bringing those to Christ. Amen. Amen and amen. Absolutely. I mean, it stands to reason, likewise, even looking at it. And I think that's one of the reasons why we know so much about the life of Peter, to show that he's somewhat of an unstable character by man's standards, let's say. Um, but it goes to show the mercies of God that even upon a little rock or something that is so, you know, uh, compared to Christ is up and down. Matter of fact, we can even talk about another passage, even in his apostleship, one of the big problems that Peter had, according to Galatians, is that he was prejudiced. That he was, when, when, when the Jews would be around, he would, he would, he would dis distance himself from the Gentiles and eat and act like you don't know the Gentiles. It's like me coming here and when, I don't know, African brethren of the church come here, I don't know the Caribbean and I'm there sitting and I'm eating with the, for example, to put it in the modern context. Obviously it's deeper than that, but it's like doing that and God forbid we have that mentality. Yes, exactly. And it says that in that passage that Paul stood up in the midst of everyone. He stood up in the midst of the, in the, of the brethren because it was a public situation. And he, and, he, and he called Peter out on it. He called him out and said, tell me, are you, have you, did you, what's this character that you're doing in my words? It's not, it's not matching scripture. So an apostle called out another apostle in the midst of everybody. Do you see? And that even yet again adds to the point that even in his conversion and after the church was formed, he still had problems that he had to overcome. Yet again, we see an act of humility because it, it doesn't say that he spoke back and he argued about the matter. He knew that he was wrong. Do you see? So yet again, it's a beautiful example of the, all the Beatitudes that we're talking about, that Peter was somebody that, you know, had his flaws. It wasn't, the church wasn't built upon him. The church, he was instrumental in the, in the establishment of the church and the running, but it's definitely not built upon him. Even deeper than that, that it shows that Peter was the apostle to the Jews. So he wouldn't have ended up in Rome. It was Paul, as we see in the book of Romans, that went to Rome and spread the word in that empire. So it doesn't even match the, the, the spreading of the word according to Acts. Um, Sister Michelle, then last question in question five. Amen. I just want to help us with the analogy, or maybe it's more of a metaphor, 
uh, where scripture says that uh, Peter's been given the keys of the kingdom. So if you have a set of keys, it's to open a lock, and a mm. lock is usually on a door. Yeah. And so the analogy that's given here is to support, let's go to John 10, verse 7, where it says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Yeah. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Amen. So we definitely know there's only one high priest. Yeah. His name is Yeshua the Messiah. Mm. And it's on him Amen. that we are saved. Amen. No flesh. Amen. Amen. We are just equal. God is not a respecter of persons. Mm. And we are equal to lead lambs and sheep. But, of course, the first assignment of that was given to Peter concerning the Israelites. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Yes, thank you. And likewise, it's beautiful for how Scripture matches because we see the door is Christ, but it says that he's given unto us the keys. So the knowledge to get to the door, and that just means that we have the understanding of Scripture. In other words, that's, if you want to make it plain and simple, and we see that even the Pharisees had that key before Jesus said, it says, you have the keys of the king of heaven and you shut it up on the people that want to come in. So they had the knowledge. God gave them the, the way to salvation through the knowledge and the oracles of, of the scriptures, but it wasn't pure in heart. So in other words, it was taken from the, the, the nation of the, of the Jews and given to the church of God. Do you see? So the way to salvation to the door is now given through the church. Amen. Uh, Sister Sandra. From my understanding, and just to, for us to remember that God is a spirit, and they that worship him, must worship. we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm. Amen. Amen. Short and sweet. There you go. A, amen. No, but as a matter of fact, that's powerful, because the spirit in truth is talking about even the sincerity. Absolutely. Amen and amen. Thank you. Um, question five. Compare Peter's actions. Last question. And compare Peter's actions in John 18, 10 with the tradition that says he asked to be crucified upside down. Also consider Peter's own admonition in 1 Peter 3, verses um, 13 to 15. Uh, if we can have a volunteer to read John 18, verse 10, please. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant. And out of and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Yes, amen. So we spoke about that earlier. Let's have a read of 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 15. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of which is good? But, and if you suffer righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of the terror neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give a right answer to any man or every man that asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Tran. So it's beautiful to hear the words of the man himself, in essence, but through the Spirit, of course, because I don't want us to get fixated on the person in any scripture. It's the spirit that spoke through him, but it's significant it used him. Um, we see that he here speaks of if you're, what, what does it say? That who's he that can harm you if we follow of that as good? But if you are doing good and you receive persecution, happy are you, right? So what beatitude is he talking about there? Persecution, absolutely. Blessed are the persecuted. The last. Now, remember, in all of the Beatitudes we've spoken about, you can't start with persecution. A Christian can't start with persecution. You have to first go through the process. And then once you've gone through all the training, all the lessons, the exam of your, your, your tutelage is going to be persecution. How do you now handle yourself now that fire is being put on, on you? That's the test. You can't, go through, you can't go through persecution if you're not first broken in heart, if you're not mournful for who you are. Even the word even says it. The word says, what good is it if you give your body to be burned and have not love? So yes, I've done the persecution. I'm, some people, you know, in the dark ages, even went to martyrdom, not because they was religious, just in protest to the system. 
they was like, no, I'm not going to give into what the empire is telling me. I would, I would rather die. So, so a lot of people, according to history, died just because they, they didn't believe, but they just didn't want to, as martyrs, not as Christians, but they gave their body to be burned, but they didn't have the heart that God is actually looking for. So would they get a reward for it? The word says it profits you nothing. You have to have the beatitudes before, before you get to the crown of persecution. Well, I don't want to be the judge of that, but in essence, yeah, in essence, according to the word, yeah. If it's not for Christ's sake, yeah, you die in vain. Yeah, it's system shop. Uh, sorry, I'll just repeat the question for the brethren online. Um, is are we talking about persecution at the end of our life only? No. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, use the microphone, please. To be careful in the prescription, yes, it's helpful that the Beatitudes are seemingly chronological in terms of maturity and discipleship, but I don't want us to think that sometimes all of those things, uh, how do I say it? The process of the Beatitudes may not be followed consequentially and we see that oftentimes outside of the western hemisphere of our world especially when those who have given their lives to Christ from other faiths their persecution can be instantaneous and so so what do you mean by that sorry someone who surrenders their life to Christ they can yes. be beheaded in a moment Yes. So their persecution can be instantaneous and they might not have gone through the process of the Beatitudes in that order for us to see. Of course, God judges the heart. Mm. And so whilst we enjoy but, uh, for, for freedom, time, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit slow time. this morning, but whilst we enjoy freedom in church here now, sitting down, we can then go, okay, this is a process that we go through and then we're persecuted. Mm. But other believers around the world can be persecuted within a moment mm. and within the next day of giving their life to Christ or indeed of at course. that moment. And so yes. Yes. I, I don't want that, us to that, think that, that a, it's yeah, totally obviously, prescriptive. Obviously, obviously, there's different situations. We can use the thief on the cross, for example. Sure. That, he was, how long was he a Christian for? How long was he baptized for? How long was he baptized for? Yeah. No, not for a split second according to scripture, but he had the understanding of the kingdom beforehand, right? But, he, but the point is, is that yes, obviously we could talk about there's exception to the rules, but if we're looking in our own life, even for someone to come to the point of, in such countries, to come to be a Christian, they have to first go through the process of broken, mournful, so forth, to see the need to even become a Christian. Okay, so I guess I'm alluding to time frames. I don't want us to think that the journey has to be a long one. No, in yeah. order to arrive at persecution because we kind of go, oh, we're persecuted and I'm not taken away because I've said it myself, I've been persecuted for different things. Mm. But our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world are met with instant persecution yeah. for their faith. Of course, yeah, absolutely, yes. Uh, Elder Paul. So those that live godly will suffer persecution. It, it doesn't matter what length of time Mm. From the moment you accepted Jesus Christ, you give it the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And Satan is about destroying God's people. That's his intent. Yeah. So therefore, it's not so much the length of time. A man can be saved the, the very day that he give his life to Jesus Christ. And, and he can also face persecution the same minute. Yes. But the fact is, Satan is persecuting the saints. Yes, yes. Amen, amen. Um, I think in order for us to understand it, I think we're talking about grand persecution. Where, do you know there's a difference in persecution or per, um, issues that one can face, for example? Um, who persecutes? Yes, it's absolutely Satan. It's clear that we get that. Um, but God allows persecution. God allows persecution for your testing. We can even look at the end time in Revelation. Why is, it that the, why is the end time such a time of trouble? The Bible calls it the hour of temptation. The hour of temptation, which means the hour of testing. Um, it's to show, even at the lukewarm Christians, is to warm them up to either make a choice now. So now you'll go back to the brokenness and all those things. So persecution, yes, in the order of things, 
in the order of things, it, it, it can come at any time. But if we're talking about grand, allowed, ordained persecution, if we will, it always comes once you have been gone through the process, you understand God, you're pure in heart, all of those things. Expect persecution to come, things to test the very fabric of who you are. That's the point that I'm making. And I think the, the, lessons, the, the, the lessons here really brought the whole process we go through in a very systematic, clear way. Um, but here it shows Peter, the very man in whom we're talking about at the end of his life, made such a decision that he said that he don't want to be crucified the right way up. He wanted to be upside down and be crucified because he didn't think himself worthy to be crucified the same way as Jesus did. Just imagine that. What power and faith that he had to have. And bear in mind, this was something that he knew beforehand. He knew from years ago that he was going to be living a life that's going to end in martyrdom. Would that make you more bold for it? Would that make you more afraid of it? I don't know. It depends on the individual. But it goes, the bit that I freely think is important when Jesus said that Satan has desired to sieve you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Amen. Amen. And the act of his faith not failing was evidenced in how, according to tradition, as it says here, he made the request to be crucified. Do you see? That's the power of prayer. When the Messiah prayed for him at that point, that gave him the power to do what he done. He didn't stop him from going through the persecution. Important that you understand that. As it says here, persecution is allowed. In God would allow it for his glory, as it says. The death he was going to go through was for the glory of God. But God allowed it. He didn't stop him from it. He didn't say that, you know, don't go through it, Satan. You know, I'm not allowing you to do it. He said, yeah, do it. But I'm going to empower my servant in going to the cross. Powerful, isn't it? Amen. Conclusion. It says, construction in progress. Ruth Graham, the wife of the beloved evangelist, Billy Graham, chose this hilarious yet thought-provoking epithet for her tombstone. End, uh, sorry? Epitaph. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, for her tombstone. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. She saw these words on a road sign and adopted them because they capture her view of discipleship as a lifelong process. Amen. Uh, Ruth's is complete. Ours continues. As a children's song says, God is patient and, long and loving and still working on us. Amen. Amen. Very timely even to think about that as well. Um, you know, God strengthened many of the families of the brethren and even the brethren here for many, many different people now um, in the season of mourning. But the actual thing is, it beautifully says there, is that the construction for them is finished. They lay and wait for a resurrection. That's it. Their, their, their fate is sealed in God. But our construction still continues, amen? So may we continue on the path of construction in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'll take pleasure and hand it back to the superintendent.